Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Stepping Up Your Active Directory Defenses. This will be an informal chat with myself and Sean Duby, who's Director of Services at Sempris. So uh, this session will be very conversational. We we'll welcome your questions at the end. And we're gonna be talking about some of the latest attacks and how you can guard against those. A lot of these attacks that are happening this summer and increasing this year focus on Active Directory, which is a common attack vector in a lot of organizations. So we'll dive into some of the recent ones, including Print Nightmare and Petit Patam. So I am here today with my old friend, Sean Duby, who, as I mentioned, is Director of Services at Sempris. And Sean and I go way back. Um, we crossed paths first at Windows IT Pro Magazine back in the day, and uh, really happy to be here at Sempris here with Sean, where he uh, works with a lot of our client companies on helping them solve their active directory security problems. So, hey, Michelle. Sean, anything mm -hmm. you want to add? No, it's uh, just uh, fun to be out you know, chatting about not so much fun things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, good to have a conversation. Yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of important things to keep track of, and the challenges for IT and security uh, teams are just on the rise. It's a lot to keep track of. <laughs> so yeah, so I think um, what we'll do today is uh, just dive right in, and we want to start with. A couple of things that came up with um, that came up this summer with Microsoft vulnerabilities in particular, and let's talk about um, the first one, Print Nightmare, which has been a big, big deal. In fact, um, CISA, which is the U.S. Homeland Security Organization for Security um, Cybersecurity, uh, basically ordered all of the agencies to patch this print nightmare problem immediately. It's such a big deal. And as you can imagine um, how many organizations are out there printing things every day and who knew that could be such a problem. So Sean, if you could just break down exactly what print nightmare is, what is the deal with it and why is it such a ubiquitous problem? Sure. <clears throat> so to talk, to understand print nightmare, it's also uh, important to understand the, the 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 print spooler service. So the print spooler service has been around forever, uh, and it is, as you can well imagine, it's used for printing. Um, <clears throat> it's enabled by default on all Windows clients in in and Windows Server. Now, it and printers themselves have been juicy targets for ex, uh, exploitation. Uh, over the years, just because of the way they're put together, and of course, for the, the vulnerabilities around printers. Uh, I, the, it's an interesting little fact that the uh, infamous uh, Stuxnet worm back in 2010, mm -hmm. uh, that was used against the Iranian uh, nuclear uh, centrifuges, exploited a vulnerability in that service to escalate privileges and propagate uh, across the network. So it's a well-known uh, attack vector. So the print, you know, this print spooler service is the traffic cop for all print jobs. It manages it uh, everywhere. It lo you know, loading printer drivers when you get new printers, you know, removing printer drivers, receiving files to be printed, et cetera, et cetera. We've all seen this happen in our own in our own print queues. I remember back in the day standing at the printer waiting for something to happen. And <laughs> apparently that's what's happening in the background is, wow. is that traffic cop is giving me permission to print. Yeah, that's that's right, exactly. And of course, um, there's a lot of third party uh, activity around this area because, you know, all of the, the the printers that are out there, all the third parties, Hewlett Packard, Epson, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all come with their own printer drivers. Right. So that there has to be the have the ability to add in drivers outside of the operating system to make that work, uh, you know. And of course, they can use the default uh, the default drivers as well. Now, because we talk about, we tend to focus on Active Directory and are around here and the things we talk about, the print spooler service on a domain controller, uh, are the, it's mainly used for printer pruning. And before I say that, I'll also say for those of you out there that have um, uh, using domain controllers as print servers as well, shame on you, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, we'll, get, we'll get to that in a second. On, for domain controllers that aren't using, um, um, that aren't acting as printer servers, what they do are, what, what the service does is printer pruning. So one of the 
not quite so widely known capabilities of Active Directory is that it publishes printers in the directory in AD so that clients can find them wherever they go. So you're, you don't have to look, you don't have to walk down, and I have done this, you don't have to walk down the aisle until you find the printer area and there's a big piece of paper with the printer name on it. You can use Active Directory to discover that. So what, uh, what printer pruning is uh, in Active Directory and on domain controllers is that when a printer is no longer available on the network, AD will automatically remove that printer object from Active Directory and so people don't no longer use it. It's important in large environment because it cleans up the printer list. Um, but it, it, as we're seeing in this, it has its uh, set of issues. So let's talk about um, print nightmare. And I'll preface this by saying that uh, Michelle's and my colleague, Ron Harrell, uh, has an excellent summary of all of this. He's, he's got a blog post that's called What You Need to Know About Print Nightmare, the Critical Windows Print Spooler Vulnerability on our, <clears throat> on our Semperus blog. So if you go to semperus.com forward slash blog, I believe is, the, is yeah. the general URL for it. And we'll, have, uh, we'll post this at the, the end of the presentation. I've got a slide with a couple of blogs that you can check out so you can look at those URLs, but they are front and center on the blog site as well. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that you could touch on, Sean, too, is, is why this summer? What happened in July that, that kind of brought this to the forefront? Well, and I actually have um, sort of a timeline of, of all this. Oh, perfect. Good. Be, because it's, it's, it's kind of a saga and it's kind of a mess. <laughs> right. Um, right. But the good news, though, it's kind of a mess. Um, the, the, end, the ends, if you... If, if you're patient, I'll get to it. You know, the end solution is, pre is pretty straightforward. So awesome. what is the vulnerability? So the vulnerability, it takes advantage of a function call in the print spooler service that allows a client to add a file as a printer driver and load it in the system context because the printer spooler uh, runs in the system context. Now, what, why is that there? What's that, what's that for? It's designed will allow users to update printers remotely. So imagine, you know, you get a brand new office printer. It means that the IT person can come in and install, uh, can install the printer uh, remotely in Active Directory. But unfortunately there was a logic flaw in how this works that allows any user to inject an unsigned DLL into the process. So that allows them to put an unsigned DLL, whatever they want, uh, in uh, on a computer uh, in uh, running as system. So in the case of a domain controller, running as system as a domain controller means you have domain dominance. So that's obviously that's a big deal. Right. So let me let me go through the timeline on this, and I won't go too much of the details because it gets pretty ugly after a while. But <laughs> <laughs> on Patch Tuesday in June. Microsoft issued uh, a patch. Uh, they call the vulnerability. This is the, what just let's summarize it and call it a 1675. It's CVE 2021 1675. Let's just call it 1675. Okay. Um, and they gave it, and they're not, this was not actually not the, the print nightmare uh, vulnerability, but it's closely associated with it. And they gave it a medium risk. Well, uh, on June 21st, they recognized that there was remote code execution capable for it, and then they upgraded the risk to high. So a few days later, um, apparently um, proof of concept exploit code appeared on GitHub accidentally and was taken wow. down, but then people had gotten a hold of it. I did not realize that that was, I did not realize that it had been posted accidentally and then discovered and then taken down. So that's, that's interesting. Yes. Um, so um, then on June 30th, uh, Benjamin Delpy, who is the fellow that developed Mimikatz, demonstrated a way around the initial patch with an update to his Mimikatz code. Um, and so then on July 1st, Microsoft created a new vulnerability, the one that is known as Print Nightmare uh, 34527, probably the better known of the two now. 
Uh, and that's that's the print nightmare one. And, and in print nightmare, um, the, uh, the printer operator security group could install both signed and unsigned printer drivers on a printer server, sort of the same, you know, the vulnerability that I'm describing. On July 6th, an out of band patch was issued uh, that actually required um, <clears throat> um, administrator as well. And then on July 13th, they finally issued uh, cumulative security updates to take care of both 1675 and 34 527. And I think that's the one that CISA was recommending that people like they they gave them a week, I think, to I think they wanted it done in 24 hours, but they gave everyone a week to get that right. Of. Right, exactly. And so the the long and short of it is in terms of patching, it goes throughout all of that. Um, basically, that cumulative update will take care of both of those issues um, because the security updates they are, they all roll up and they're all um, they're all cumulative. Now that's not all that you should do though. You know the recommendation right. is uh, on any domain controller you don't need the print spooler service on any domain controller. It doesn't the the assuming that you're not using it as a as a print server and if you are you need to use something else. So why, just to stop you there for a second, why would people be using it um, as a print server? I mean, what are the reasons that that would be happening in the first place? Well, Is it, it just, um, a simple, just don't know that it could be so, you know, vulnerable? Yeah. Um, so in medium and small business. Like, does it make anything easier? And that's sure, sure. I mean, it's one less server that you have to stand up for something. Right. In, in medium and, and especially smaller businesses, people don't want to spend the money, especially when you're dealing with physical servers. People don't want to right. spend money to have a dedicated domain controllers. That's money sitting there and and resources and processor sitting there that they don't um, that they don't. Um, have access to that they you know it's just oh why do, why do i do that i can do i can do more with this mm -hmm. uh so they'll put lots of stuff on a domain controller and now in larger environments you know that's just not what you do you you because mm -hmm. you recognize it as a security boundary a right. domain controller should shouldn't have certificate services on it you know you don't put dhcp on it you don't put print services on it it's just the domain controller but in smaller environments it happens all the time and so you, and, and as you, this print nightmare demonstrates, it increases the attack surface of, of a domain controller of Active Directory. So even if you have perfect Active Directory hygiene, would you still have been uh, vulnerable to these exploits? Yes, yeah. uh, because un unless you turn, uh, unless you disable the print service. Okay. okay. So, it's, you know, because it's, it's enabled out of the box. And unless you specifically go off and turn off that service, uh, you would have been vulnerable to it. Okay. So let's get back to your list of fixes. Right. So, I mean, this essentially what you need to do is in, in order of priority, really, um, I would say, number one, disable the print spooler service on, on all your domain controllers. I know in a, in a, you know, in a change management environment, and here we are, you know, we're over a month after the cumulative uh, July um, <clears throat> security updates, you should have this installed. But if you don't, for some reason, you should disable the print ser spooler service mm -hmm. first on every, on, on all your domain controllers. Now, our, our uh, what I would call an FOS, a friend of Semperus, uh, one of our, uh, our friends, uh, Sander Burkauer, uh, in the Netherlands, who is a many time Microsoft MVP, uh, he has an excellent blog in general. Uh, the, his blog has the interesting title uh, of called The Things That Are Better Left Unspoken. Ah. And, and in this, Sander has a, has a blog post on how to disable the print spooler service on domain controllers. And I'll make sure that it gets included in the resources after the webinar. And he's Sander is very technical and very detail oriented, and he goes through it in great detail. 
Is that a new blog or one that had been posted? Uh, it's been out there for a few weeks. He was yeah. he was pretty prompt about it. Yeah. Uh, he uh, amazingly, I, I I still I hesitate to say this out loud because I can't believe he, he does it. He says he he writes a blog post every day. Wow. And 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 Sander does not write. This is what I had for breakfast type <laughs> blog posts. So. So anyway, Model for one, it. disable the print spooler service and you can use group policy to do it. Uh, number two, uh, install the monthly security service, uh, the security updates like we've been talking about. Now, if you disable the, the print spooler service on domain controllers, what we've talked about is that this will disable the automatic um, printer spooling. It's not a big deal. You know, what it comes down to is when you decommission a printer in, in your organization, someone has to go into Active Directory and delete that printer object. Mm -hmm. That's it. So it's not like it comes with a lot of pain associated with um, improving the security in your environment. Got it. Okay. Or another fix is we could just stop printing. Yeah. I try. Uh, <laughs> You told me uh, you told me you've gotten much better about it. I uh, when I when I write a, an article or a post or something, I still I still print that out, and I'm really old fashioned. So Michelle and I are both come from traditional print media, uh, so I've survived the death of uh, of print media uh, for Windows IT Pro, and the death of so many trees, <laughs> and the death of so many trees. I still print it out. Yeah. Um, and I have a and I have a red pen that I just use to go in off in a corner and then go hack at my writing to make sure that it's a little bit better than it was before. So once I figured out how to pull a form into Adobe and just fill in the blanks that way, I was done with printing. So <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's <great>. my <laughs> that's my takeaway. So let's move on to the other one, Petit Patam. Um, which is a little bit harder, I think, to get um, to get our arms around, at least at first glance. This this one seems pretty complicated. I understand that it's a it was an authentication coercion exposure, and it's not really one thing, but seemed to be a, a combination of several factors. So, can you break this one down for us? And this also came very quickly after Print Nightmare. It seemed like it was days or maybe a week or two. Yes. Yes. Uh <laughs> Yeah, so as you say, uh, Petit Patam, it's a tool that is used to force window hosts to authenticate to other machines using something that most of us have never looked into, which is the encrypting file system remote, which is EFS RPC API call. So as far as we're going uh, related to Active Directory, the way to think about it in the vulnerability is like this. Um, a computer can, can do what's called an NTL, NTLM relay attack against an Active Directory Certificate Services server. So ADCS is a role that you can install on Windows Server if you're running your own PKI, your own public uh, key infrastructure environment. So an ADCS server, you can have a certificate authority on it, or it could be a, a, a child server on it, but it's running the certificate services role. And this NTLM relay attack would go to a couple of services. The first would be uh, what's called the uh, Certificate Authority Web Enrollment Service or mm -hmm. the Certificate Enrollment Web Service. So with this attack, what can happen is that an attacker can obtain a certificate from the Certificate Authority that can then be used to get a Kerberos ticket granting ticket, a TGT. Mm -hmm. Now getting a TGT from Kerberos in an unauthorized manner is essentially a golden ticket attack. Right. Yeah. So once you have a TGT, you can go off, you know, it's a basically a forged ticket granting ticket that gives you the ability to go off to uh, a KDC, a, Kerber, a, a, Kerber, a key distribution center, mm -hmm. which is sits on every domain controller. If you have a forged ticket granting ticket, you can go to a domain controller and say, I give me a, give me a, a a ticket for service X, and I have the right to do that. Uh, Basically, so, yeah, we keep talking about having the keys to the kingdom with Active Directory, and this just seems like a classic example of that. Yeah, 
That's that's right. That's it. That's exactly it. Now, on August 10th, um, there was a partial fix for this that was designed to block unauthorized calls to that API, um, but authenticated calls are still allowed. Now, mitigating this is a little more complicated uh, until Microsoft has comes up with something better for it. And it and it's most of the mitigations are related to NTLM mm -hmm. and uh, disabling NTLM. So disabling incoming NTLM on Active Directory certificate services, servers, ADCS servers, um, disabling NTLM on domain controllers. This is, uh, if you're an Active Directory person, you know, you're, you're rolling your eyes going, oh, I've been trying to disable NTLM on my an Active Directory since you know since when my son was born and we're still not there yet because applications still rely on NTLM in some manner, but uh, it's a, you know a vulnerability is a vulnerability so you do what you can to mitigate it. Mm -hmm. uh, I I would say for more detail on this because it is more complicated. Um, uh, another good reference for this is uh, going to CERT. So kb.cert.org, and the the particular vulnerability number is 405600, and it is a it's a good summary of this vulnerability and some of the steps that you can take to try to protect yourself against the vulnerability. Yeah, and Ron's also got a good blog about Petit Patam on our website as well, and he refers to a lot of other resources as well. So right. um, the one that you just referenced, Sean, we, we should add that to the blog. I think that okay. would be helpful. We've got a, a question that just came in. Let me know if you want to address it now or we can hold it to the end. So the, uh, let's hold it to the end. Okay, yeah. sounds good. All right, so let's keep rolling. Are we any, so what's next on Petit Patam? Uh, that's kind of the summary that I have on it for right now. Um, there have been other, you know, ugly things that were that were have been floating around this time. You know, we had uh, we had something. Sometimes it's 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 hard to keep track. Just uh, keeping track of the um, the naming of these things. So there was something that came out called Serious Sam. Yes. Uh, back in uh, it was last month. And uh, that's Sirius Sam has also has also been christened Hive Nightmare because now apparently everybody's jumping on the nightmare bandwagon. So, um, so that is, uh, and if you if you want to know what the uh, the CVE for that is, that's CVE twenty twenty one three six nine three four. And essentially, this is this is pretty easy to understand. So. <clears throat> In one of the uh, the Windows system folder structure, this is a Windows system 32 config folder. The access control list for that folder, the ACLs for that folder, uh, in recent, I can't tell you exactly which build it is, had begun granting read access to non-administrative users. So what that means is that anybody on a local system um, can gain access to uh, a file there, a very important file there, which is the local security accounts manager, the SAM uh, file is there, which means you can grab it, you can take it somewhere and you can crack it. And mm -hmm. then you can gain access to local accounts um, <clears throat> on that, on that, uh, on that, that computer. Now the, uh, uh, Active Directory domain controllers don't specifically use that SAM because they use the um, they use the Active Directory itself for the management. But that is an inroad into the in inroad into the environment, which can then be used for horizontal reconnaissance, you know, and and further inroads in the, in yeah. that area. So it's more of a stepwise path rather right. than a direct path from Active Directory. Yes, so. that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So next, we didn't actually have this on the agenda when we were um, promoting this session, but um, the problems with exchange is just kind of a gift that keeps on giving as far as attacks. <laughs> and of course, there's a lot of, there's so much interconnectedness between exchange and Active Directory. And 
you and I were talking earlier that earlier this week about um, exchange and you know mail just being one of the first things that moved to the cloud. So people seem to adopt um, Outlook 365 or Office 365 as, as almost their first um, cloud thing. And um, the complications of administering exchange on premises is is vast. So why don't you just kind of take us through a short history of Exchange and Active Directory security, and how those are related, and why that's such a rich vein for cyber attackers to mine. Sure. Um, well, I think one of the interesting aspects of this is how, you know, as you said, Exchange is has been critical for such a long period of time. People. And frankly, Exchange is the reason that Active Directory is as successful as it is because people wanted Exchange. So because of getting to get Exchange, you had to get Active Directory. So Active Directory spread with Exchange. People didn't, although if you're an identity person like me, you think Active Directory just for the sake of AD is cool, but the rest of the world uh, wanted there it. There had to be a reason. <laughs> there had to actually be a reason for it. Yeah. That's right. And so Exchange is tightly tied to Active Directory. And I think um, what we have seen in the life cycle of Exchange is parallel somewhat to what's going on with Active Directory, which is in terms of skills, in terms of patching and all of that, it's been around for a long time. As you said, it's one of the, because it's very complicated to run on premises. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the first workloads that moved into cloud services, Exchange Online or other, uh, other online mail services. And so for the ones that still do have Exchange Online, I mean, that still have Exchange On-Prem, I think that we're, we're seeing uh, what, we're, what we also see in Active Directory nowadays, which is that the skill sets are becoming rarer and rarer right. to um, keep it up keep exchange up to date, keep it tip top, do the complicated patching that's necessary to do for exchange because we're talking about multiple on-premises servers that are tightly interconnected and have to be patched in a certain order. So the tendency is to do some very basic patching of it, but it's very hard to keep it to, to keep up. So when we had the Haftium breach, and how quickly that happened. Um, it was very difficult for administrators to keep up with it. And even now, there was just recently the other day, uh, renewed uh, conversation about the web shell, uh, other web right. shell vulnerabilities in, in exchange. Right, and I think um, another really good resource on this is you did a podcast, I believe it was a podcast rather than a web seminar back in maybe March with Alan Sagano, yes. who runs a consulting firm and he had um, some clients who were um, struggling uh, to recover from the Hafnian breach. So there's a lot of great info from Alan in that podcast. Uh, we'll... Um, We'll include that in our follow-up email as a resource for people to check out. He's got a good time. It, in fact, we've got a summary blog on the site called Timeline of a Hafnium Attack, mm. and it does a really good job of, of laying out um, what the chain of events were there right. and where the, where the vulnerabilities were. Yes, yes. So anything else to point out about the um, linkedness of Active Directory and Exchange and what to watch out for there? Or is it just apply the patches when they come out? It is really, I mean, and it's, we can, we can see, and especially, especially if you are, as pretty much everybody is nowadays, using uh, internet facing interfaces to, uh, to exchange, you know, mm -hmm. Outlook Web Access, uh, which is, which is the inroad for the attackers as well. So yeah, I think, you know, patch now, patch often. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So let's see, besides this, we were going to touch a little bit on a couple of other things that popped up this summer. And one of them, which we haven't really talked about a lot lately is wiper attacks, but there was an interesting, um, 
one dubbed Meteor Express that um, attacked Iran's train system. Right. And the connection with AD is a little bit more obscure. I think um, you you did some digging on this to, to find out that connection there. Um, but it was definitely a case of elevated permission. So do you want to just take us through that a little bit? Sure. Um, and and I, the common thread, and let me start out by saying the common thread in all of these is using Active Directory as the highway. Right. You know, we, we see that. And I love to bring this, uh, not specifically related to Meteor Express, but I love to bring this up because I don't think it's well known. And I keep, um, and it was a real eye opener uh, at uh, the Identiverse talk this summer, Alex Weiner, who is the Director of Identity Services at Microsoft, mm -hmm. and it was intimately involved in the whole SolarWinds, SolaraGate, you know, whatever you want to call yeah. that, that series of um, that whole incident. He said that uh, in every case, well, first off, he said that only about, he said less than 5% of the companies that had been attacked by um, the, the threat actor were compromised using, um, using the SolarWinds exploit. 95% mm -hmm. um, of them were compromised using password spray attacks against Active Directory. Mm -hmm. And once they are in, they use the classic uh, attack chain to gain domain dominance, uh, mm -hmm. which is what they then used to compromise uh, ADFS and then forge, uh, forge a signing certificate, which then allowed them to get into Azure Active Directory and Exchange and Office 365. So it's the same pattern everywhere because if you're a bad guy, you know, you're know you not interested in all these different ways of getting things done. You're interested in getting to that target on the far end. And if you've got this big barn door in front of you, why not keep using it? Yeah, so, and I think, I, th I think that's another thing that we keep bringing up all the time that um, should actually give a lot of IT and security pros hope is that a lot of these avenues are just like locking your car. You know, there's some really simple low hanging fruit, fruit, and we're really seeing that with uh, Purple Night is the security assessment tool that uh, we released in March. It's free, and a lot of organizations have used it to run a scan of their environment and just see, you know, what security holes do I have? And, um, you know, we've been talking to a few of them lately. They are feel blindsided. They had no idea that they had some of these misconfigurations in their organization, and um, I think the, the message here is you got to know about it before you can fix it. But once you do those fixes, a lot of those easy paths for attackers are cut off. And then they have to work harder and harder and harder. And maybe they'll shop elsewhere. Yeah, so. well, <clears throat> you, live in, uh, you live in Colorado. So I'll use the analogy of, uh, yeah, you don't have to be faster than the bear. You just have to be faster than the slower guy. That is exactly in, right. Yeah. In the group. So if, you're, if, you're, uh, if your environment is more difficult to get in, it's entirely possible they just won't, they'll waste time and you know, just yeah. choose to go someplace else. So, so getting back to Meteor Express, yeah. I, wanted to, yeah, I wanted to know if you could just um, quickly remind us what a wiper attack is. It's, all, it's been all ransomware for you know, the right. last several months, and this is the first um, um, like high headline wiper attack I've seen. So let's just review what that is. Sure, wiper, wiperware in a, in twenty five words or less. Wiperware is like ransomware without a ransom note and out without decryption. Mm -hmm. So basically, they encrypt uh, they encrypt your files, and there's no decryption key, thereby right. making them useless. Thereby basically bricking it. Now, Meteor Express uh, is wiperware, and what it did in its Active Directory uh, hook here for our talk is that it spreads via a group policy in Active Directory. So group policy has the ability to distribute software. Uh, and so it can distribute good software, it can distribute bad software. Uh, so in this case, it distributed bad software. And what happened is an ex executable called nti.exe, which coincidentally is the name of my old uh, Active Directory group at Intel, they're called <laughs> NTI, uh, corrupts the master boot record. Um, 
of oh and i forgot it first thing that happens is uh and it it's encrypts the file system then when the in file system is encrypted then nti corrupts the master boot record the ntfs master boot record and then finally something called ms setup locks the system uh, it also does things before it also deletes any volume shadow copies on the system and as a last little insult uh, unjoins the computer from its active directory domain as well. So sounds pretty devastating. Yeah, I mean it is it's not happy software. It's designed it's you know, all, the, all the steps that you're looking at are just trying to design to jack up an operating system as much as possible. And what what are some of the most famous wiper attacks? So um, this this latest one, I mean, it, it it caught my attention, but I know there's been more famous ones in the past. Right. Well, I mean, I was, this one that I love to talk about, of course, is not Petya. Oh so right. Yeah. Not Petya in in 2017 that Russia used against Ukraine, and but the collateral damage cost uh, Maersk 300 million dollars, and it cost Merck. Uh, 900 million dollars and is estimated to have cost uh, worldwide 10 billion dollars worth of damage and that was wiperware that was propagated with a couple of zero day exploits and mm -hmm. spreads like lightning throughout a corporate network and encrypts everything in sight using active directory as its as its propagation method so right fortunately not not, not so much one way wiperware right now the that's you know ransomware is sort of a a variation on a theme mm -hmm. ransomware and wiperware are like you know evil brother and sister yeah wiperware seems like the thing to do when you don't really you're just doing it yeah you know? when, you, when do you want it when you want to wreak havoc yeah that's that's what you do yeah if you're in business then you use ransomware <laughs> if this is like your yeah, yeah. And well, and, and even, you know, you can, there's social engineering associated with this too. So you could have wiperware. And then, and, and frankly, uh, not Petya to add a little twist, a little knife in the wound, not Petya was, it was wiperware, but it was designed to look like ransomware. So mm -hmm. it would, it would pop up a ransom screen to send you down the, I won't say the merry path, but to send you down the path of trying to get it figured out. Uh, when there was no figuring it out, but the hope is that it delays your delays your recovery for a few hours. Right. Okay. And then the last thing we're going to touch on today is the Kaseya uh, Kaseya attack. So um, this is, uh, I think, becoming more of a concern for a lot of organizations because it involves software that gets pushed out automatically. And um, you know the most famous, of course, in the last year, incidents of that is SolarWinds. That the malware was sitting there since last March, and you know just um, creeping into all of the software that um, serves government agencies and organizations across the world. So, what is the what is the answer here? And I, I think this really raises the risk profile for all organizations. And what can they do about that since it's so hard to police every third party that you work with? Well, we're certainly, we just, we, we as a company are, and not just us, but, you know, any uh, software companies are seeing, seeing the, the impact resonate from companies like Kaseya or, and SolarWinds, right. uh, where, you know, you, you trust a third party to go deeply inside your systems and then that that gets compromised which by the way as i mentioned not petya earlier that's how not petya propagated mm -hmm. they you know it used trusted third party software ukrainian tax software that had you know their update servers and uh the russian uh, uh the gru penetrated that update server and put the code in there. And then when everybody downloaded their tax software, everybody got the, everybody got the, 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 the not Petya uh, worm. So it's the same thing as the su supply chain attack. And so what companies are doing right now is they're scrambling to try and secure their su supply chains. They're going back to their providers, especially the providers you know, that are SaaS and, and have mm -hmm. automatic downloads happening, which was thought of as a good thing. Now they're not quite so sure. Everybody's shutting off automatic downloads. And what's really big right now is everyone's doing vendor risk assessments. They're going back 
and they're sending out new vendor risk assessments as they try to protect themselves. But it's a thorny problem because companies, everybody relies on third-party software. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, the easy answer would be to never allow an automatic update, but then that um, may prevent you from getting important patches that come right. along. Yeah. That's so. exactly, that's exactly right. You know, and the, the biggest example and the biggest thing that, you know, that may make people stay up at night is the, the biggest patching system in the world is the Microsoft update system. Yeah. And you know, that's protected nine ways to Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, and it used to be when that first started happening, you know, nobody accepted those patches come in and then everybody stood up their Windows Server, Windows Server update services, what WSUS. So they could then examine each one as they came in and test it and all that. And I think that's probably still happening in larger organizations, but boy, in medium and in smaller organizations, let's just go right now because sometimes these things come out and they're like, oh no, <laughs> this vulnerability is here. Here's the patch fort. We're already starting to see exploits to it. You really have to do these things in a hurry, so. Right. Um, we've got a few questions coming in. Please do post your questions either in the chat here, that's fine, or there's a little Q&A um, uh, icon at the bottom if you want to use that mechanism. Um, so we'll we'll just go on and start answering a few questions. So sure. um, from George, companies are already migrating to the cloud. We also say that AD is the last system being shut down. It will take years before AD is gone. Many um, on-prem um, assets depend on legacy code, which causes those vulnerabilities. It's becoming more common than we want. Microsoft is heavily investing in Azure Active Directory and for on-prem stuff only fixes and updates. Do you think due to all these vulnerabilities that companies would migrate faster to the cloud to get rid of on-prem systems? Boy, that's a really interesting question. That, that would be a great survey question for CIOs and CISOs. The CISOs would probably say, heck yes. And the CIOs may say not so fast. Um, as in anything, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a risk analysis. At this point. Yeah, and I think I think there's um, there's vertical industries like financial services where just putting things in the cloud is not easy, and it's you know talk about regulations and checklists that you go through. Um, it, it just might not be that easy for them to make that leap, but that is an that is an interesting question, and I think the the other aspect of this is the the time that it takes, the additional time that it takes to vet all of these solutions is um, probably a deterrent for a lot of organizations. So it'll be interesting to see how much the, the um, desire for security trumps speed and agility in companies, which has typically been, you know, the, the highest goal. You know, you've, you're trying to move fast and, you know, break things fast and disrupt and all of that. If you have to take three weeks to onboard somebody because their active directory permissions have to be set just so, um, you know, some companies can still get a little frustrated by that. Yeah, I can tell you from personal experience, having worked with a lot of large companies that the the difficulty of getting of making any kind of a change in the environment as more and more layers of security are put in place, which also means more and more layers of human bureaucracy mm -hmm. uh, and to make changes. You know, I I work with I work with some very large organizations that are uh, deploying our software or doing proof of concepts with our software, and the layers of things that they have to go through to make the software communicate <clears throat> because of all the, you know, it's the firewall team and here's the request and it'll take three weeks to get that request approved. And, oh, they opened the port in the wrong direction or they didn't open this port in the right direction. So you have to go back and do it again. Or you've got these 10 security tools running on here. I only know how three of them work. We've got to get our mm -hmm. other security team. involved. So it becomes so onerous yeah. to even keep the business running. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a, it's not an easy problem because yeah, 
these on these line of business applications are making money for the company. After all, this is all in support right. of business. But to George's point, I don't I don't see companies going back to building things in house. You know that to me is a, just a, a really futile path. You're not going to build these systems yourself just so you can keep an eye on them. You know, even the tiniest little one person businesses use all sorts of SaaS products and services to, you know, sell their things on Etsy or, you know, run their blog or whatever. And, and I don't think that's going to go away. So yeah, agreed. No, uh, agreed. And, and that has been the paradigm for the last few years, of course, is small businesses starting up and mm -hmm. starting is in the cloud is why, why have uh, on premises if you don't need it? That said, most organizations have been around for longer and they have on-premises. And as, as George said, he has, it, he has it summarized quite nicely. Microsoft is looking up here yes. and, they're, and they're just barely, you know, they're patching down here. They haven't addressed the, and the inherent vulnerability around Active Directory and the way it is. And it's very interesting to watch like Brad Smith's Microsoft, Brad mm -hmm. Smith's president of Microsoft, his testimony on Capitol Hill and yeah. around solar winds and hearing where all of that is. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as our colleagues, Gil Kirkpatrick and Guido Grillenmeyer um, noted in a white paper that they have coming out, kind of refreshing their Active Directory disaster recovery um, guidance, they noted that uh, Windows. 2019 has really nothing in it, you know, around new AD security things. So, right. Yeah. It's uh, once a, a long time ago, a Microsoft program manager, when he was looking, when we were talking about when we were deeply involved in Active Directory and changes that could be needed and all that. And he said, imagine uh, <clears throat> and how, how you have to be careful how these changes and what kind of ramifications they may have. He said, imagine ordering pizza for a million people. You know, you have to be very careful of what, uh, what ingredients you ask for on it. That's so right. I, I firmly believe in it, having talked to lots of Microsoft leadership about it, it is, yeah. they're very focused in that direction. And I, I don't see how the, how the two is resolved anytime soon. I think, right. I know I'll be retired before we see Active Directory go away. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's go ahead and show a slide with resources here um, and talk about some of the some of the ways you can get some more information. So the, the two main things are Ron Harrell's blogs, what you need to know about Print Nightmare, and then detecting and mitigating the Petit Patam attack. And those are chock full of resources. Um, Download Purple Night. So one thing I've forgotten to mention, but this is a big day for us because uh, Purple Night 1.3 was just released today and it actually scans for 76 security indicators of compromise and exposure, including 11 new ones. Um, and those include uh, Print Nightmare and Petit Patam. So if you haven't fixed those things yet, one of the first things you can do is download Purple Night. It's free. It's a very lightweight utility. Um, you download it and run it as someone um, described it to me. It, it looks and gets, it doesn't change anything. So it's, it's low impact on your system. You'll get a nice report that um, tells you where you need to fix your Active Directory security weaknesses. So it kind of gives you a prioritization. The, the risks are flagged from critical to warning to informational. So definitely do that. And then um, just keep, keep checking the blog. We write all the time about Windows um, Active Directory security vulnerabilities. Sean has a couple of great web seminars about this as well, uh, walking through the, the different security vulnerabilities. Then we've got a blog series coming as well um, that we'll be unleashing over the next few weeks. We're going to talk about Golden Ticket, which um, Sean mentioned today. Lots of things around DC sync rights. Uh, Kerber roasting is a big one coming up very soon on the blog. So just keep checking the Sempress blog and we'll have a lot of background information on these and how you can mitigate them. So with that, Sean, anything else you would like to add before we wrap up today? No, I think, uh, I think we had a good wrap up. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the upcoming few months won't be as exciting 
in the list of, uh, of yeah it's been kind of a creepy summer for, yeah. for cyber attacks so but i think um i think that's the way of the world and again i just tell everyone don't lose hope just you know keep working through those vulnerabilities and remember these guys are looking for the easy path so don't leave your car unlocked and that'll help a lot be faster than their neighbor when the bear is chasing you yeah faster than the average colorado bear <laughs> 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 or the person the bear is chasing so all right. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate you joining us today. Thank you.